for you. So please grab your book, have your hand there, because there's a few things I want to refer to you. So it, it talks about the nature of light, the frequency, color, and intensity. Three very important concepts, guys, when it comes to lighting science. Um, again, the best lighting that you're going to have, guys, is the lighting that comes of, of, from Mother, uh, comes to Mother Earth from the sun, right? That's the best light, light source you're going to have. Unfortunately, we have something called night, and we need to utilize other sources of light, right? Then you get into the manufactured lighting system. A couple of things I want to mention in this chapter, guys. Um, in order to, in order for you, Derek, to produce light like that light above your head, the light that you have to produce have to be within so-called the visible spectrum. In order to see things as a human being with our naked eye, in order to see it, it has to be within that visible, uh, what they call a visible spectrum. The visible spectrum, guys, start with the violet and go all the way to the red. Violet to red. Um, ultraviolet you cannot see it infrared that's your remote control you use at home right when you push by it ultraviolet this one we use it to kill bacteria you're going to see later on they use the, the, these rays um in um, wastewater treatment plants they have lights the ultraviolet lights they put it as the water comes out of the wastewater treatment plants and goes into the sea rivers and and lakes and what's not they, they pass it through light so it kills the bacteria. So there's application for it. So one more time, ultraviolet and infrared are outside the, the spectrum, the lighting spectrum. So in order to create a light that can be seen, guys, right? Anything that can be seen has to be between the, uh, below the ultraviolet, the, between the violet and the red. So violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red, these are your um, uh, visible spectrum. Um, so, Everybody understand, in order to produce light, you have to be within this range. Any comments, guys, about this range? There will be questions on the test, I guarantee you. But the range of the visible range is going to start with the violet and end up with the, with the red. There's also have wavelength, guys. Here's the wavelength for every one of these lights. The wavelength from where the wave starts, like sinusoidal wave, can you guys see that? From this point to this point, that's called the wavelength. Uh, the wavelength goes in nanometers nanometer so start with 400 all the way to 750 nanometer a nano anybody knows what a nano is nanometer is 10 to the power minus 9 very small 10 to the power minus 9 so starting with the violet, uh, ultraviolet the violet here start with 400 nanometer goes all the way to 750 nanometer within a range of wavelength they call it the wavelength Within that wavelength, human uh, human being eyes can see. Above that wavelength and below that wavelength, um, you have to you have to use other means of seeing. Did you guys see that the, the key point between the spectrum, visible spectrum? Okay, ultraviolet not seen, infrared not seen. There is a 400 nanometer. You go up to 750 nanometer. These are the length, the wavelength. Here's from where it starts to where it's end. Here's one whole wave. That's called the wavelength. With the wavelength comes something called the frequency, guys, for the lights. Every light has a frequency. The frequency of the light equal one over the wavelength. For example, if you go to the frequency to the um, red here, if you want to find the red, take one divided by 750 um, times 10 to the power 9 because that's nano. If you do the math, you're going to end up with um, 1.3 times uh, 10 to the power 6 um, hertz, or um, this is megahertz. One more time. Every light, every color has a wavelength and a frequency. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? We understand wavelength and frequency. Uh, this start with red. The wavelength for the red is 750 nanometer. What is a nanometer? A nanometer is 10 to the power... 10 to the power minus 9. What do you guys know what our uh, 10 to the power minus 9 is? Is 1 over 1 and 9 zeros in the front of it. So that uh, I don't know how much you remember from the math. So if you take 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3, that's a nanometer. 1 over this number, that's called a nanometer, right? So there's one, two, three. Everybody understand that? Nano, it's very, very small. Nanometer, they go by meters. 
very, very small. Um, in order to convert the nanometer, guys, into frequency, here's the formula. You take one over the waveform, no problem. Take one over 750 multiplied by 10 to the power 9. Did you guys do powers? Did you do how to multiply, divide powers? Maybe in high school and grade school and with powers. So when you do the math for this one, guys, you do your math, you end up with 1.3, and, and then you take the 9 to the top, see that 9, 10 to the power minus 9, take it to the top, becomes 10 to the power 9, and then you do the math, you end up with 1.3 gigahertz, and this is mega, megahertz. That's the, the frequency of the color red, the frequency of the color red. Wavelength 750, frequency 1.3 um, megahertz, or 10 to the power 6. Anyway, so every color has a frequency and a wavelength, and the frequency and the wavelength are the opposite, right? The higher the wavelength, the lower the frequency. Can you see that? The higher the wavelength for the color, the lower the frequency. Okay? The more frequency the color have or the, the light have, the more power. Like ultraviolet, if you're exposed to ultraviolet, it will hurt you. Ultraviolet, you know, lower frequency, High, a lower uh, length, higher frequency, um, and more energy. Okay. Any comments, guys? What I want to clarify here is three things. Every color has a frequency and a wavelength. And the frequency of the wavelength are the opposite of each other. What we care is about these colors from the violet all the way to the red because that's a spectrum that we can see through. Anything above that, that's a whole different science. Comments, question is about that? Makes sense? That's what the chapter talks about. Okay, then we have the color mixing. If you guys go to, so please go to page um, page four in your book. I don't have this graphic. Uh, page four, if you look in the upper left corner, uh, radiated and reflected color. If you mix the green, can you guess you've done that? If you mix the primary color, red, green, and blue, you mix, you, you mix the red, uh, Red, uh, green, and blue. Can you guys change the color here? That little color, the big circle here should be blue. That little here. So change that one into blue, please. Right here. I think it's accidentally written black. That little one here should be blue. So if you take the green, red, and blue, mix them up with a um, certain proportion, you're going to get the white in the middle, right? Um, that's called uh, additive. When you add them up together, you get the color white. That's how they mix color, you guys, in TVs and what's not. Again, I'm not going to make it science. Just be aware of the additive um, uh, property of it. So blue, red, green will get you white. If you mix green and blue, you get cyan. And if you mix green and red, you get yellow. And if you mix red and blue, you get magenta. Can you guys see that color, color mixing mechanism? Uh, probably, Karen, you know about this more than I do right all how to mix colors and and what's not so that's the additive the one next to it they call it subtractive the subtractive they start with the cyan which the cyan the yellow and uh, and magenta and then if they uh, when they mix them up together you could in the middle can you see you get black instead of white and you get uh, blue green and red the opposite basically the opposite of each other anyway i'm not getting into you guys in the science but be aware that the smarter than Chad, the people who work with, with theaters and what's not, they mix these colors, TVs is notoriously famous of them, they mix these colors in different proportions to give you different colors. The primary colors mix them to give you different colors. So, uh, radiated versus reflected. Radiated, you use the primary color, green, blue, and red, then you get the white in the center, cyan, yellow, and magenta. Reflected, if you mix the yellow, cyan, and magenta, you get black right in the middle. Can you guys see that? As well as green, red, and blue, which is the primary color. Any comments, any questions about mixing colors? That's all what I'm going to go. Um, you can go online and find a lot of researches. So why it's important to mix colors? How, that's how they make these lights, guys. They can make the light more blue, more white, more bluish, what's not. So that's what you're going to be uh, seeing. So that's why we call it mixing colors. Any comments, any questions about mixing colors? Does it make sense? So three things. We have the visible spectrum that you guys need to know. Start with the violet. The violet the moves all the way to the red. The length of every color, the frequency of every color, as well as mixing these colors to get other colors. 
Any comments, any questions? Make sense? No? Not yet? Okay. Now moving away from the science into something called stroboscopic. This is called the stroboscopic effect. Anybody ever heard the term stroboscopic effect? Anybody? Okay. Here's what happened, Adam. When you have light, when you guys have light in, um, running at the same frequency, you're burning this lighting fixture at the same frequency as the motor that running. The because of the frequency that this light is burning at and the motor is running at the same frequency in a manufacturing floor guys you could there would be a situation where you could be looking at a saw a table saw running and you cannot see that this table saw is running now talk about safety and danger right so one more time because the frequency, because the lights are running at the same frequency as the other equipment in the manufacturing floor, there could be a situation where your light will be deceived, deceived, your light will be deceived because of the effect of the light that reflected from that saw. The effect of the light reflected on the saw, your light could be deceived to believe that that running saw is not running and still. And I'm not going to tell you what happened, Derek, if you go and you think the saw is not running, um, you can see it's running, and you go touch it, right? Here, here goes your fingers. Anyway, because of the stroboscopic effect, the Smarter Than Chad guys designed in a manufacturing floor, they give three-phase systems. So to get rid of that, they feed this set of light from phase A, phase B, phase C. When they feed them from different phases, they will guarantee the lights are coming from different phases. They reach the zero point at different times. So long story short, they eliminate the effect, so-called stroboscopic effect. Can I have a thumbs up, Chad? We know stroboscopic effect, which is deception of the light, that the light will see rotating object as still happening in one phase. If you add multiple phases, they reach the zero at different points. And because they reach a zero at different point in the, in the circle here, they reach the zero at different points if you have three signals like this then because of that guys basically it eliminates the effect of stroboscopic effect any comments any questions we don't have a many that's a major thing in manufacturing floor next project adam when we go to the manufacturing floor what we want to be when you guys go to i'm going to tell you you're going to bring three circuits to the manufacturing floor and you now you know why three circuits phase a phase b and phase c Anyway, with certain lights. Any comments, guys, about stroboscopic effect? Deception of the eyes when it comes to rotation, rotating equipment, that's not, it's not working. Okay, so that's, that. these are the concepts that I would like guys to go over. Um, visible spectrum, frequency, wavelength, and uh, color mixing, stroboscopic effect. So these are the major things. Um, the second thing I would like you guys Oh, I would like you guys to go to page five. Please, the book is, I don't have these pictures, so I'd like you guys to go to page five. Page five right here shows um, a mercury vapor lamp. We don't use mercuries anymore. We use them only for comparing things. And it will give you um, the relative power as well as the wavelength in nanometer. So if you guys look at the bottom here, it gives you, when you have a mercury lamp, which we don't use them anymore, as we're using it for comparison. Right here will give you, when you manufactured light, you manufactured colors in the light. Based on the type of the fixture, it will give you more of this color, zero of the other color, or less of the third color. For example, if you look at mercury, um, it gives you guys violet, small amount of violet. It's more, it gives you a lot of purple, and it gives you green, and it gives you yellow. Can you guys see that? Look at the blue in it. The blue is very small. So when they manufacture lights, they manufacture them in a way where it can give you more or less of certain colors. That's why you see, Adam, when you look at certain light, you see the more bluish. Some lights are more bluish, more reddish, more whitish. Did you guys hear me? That mixture of these lights. So that's, that's um, so a yellow light. If you guys go to the one right next to it, look how they enhance them. So they enhance the one, um, it's called Deluxe Lamp. They enhance it so they get more colors. Can you guess you get red and green? The first one had no red and green whatsoever. You can't, uh, you mix, you can't see under that light. If your car is red, you can't see it. 
um, you know, you'll see it. You, you can't distinguish between red and green underneath it. If you enhance it, how do you enhance it? Chemically enhance it. What they do, they guys use chemicals to treat the arcs that are coming out of these lamps to get you different colors. The more color the light can give, the better you can distinguish between colors. Otherwise, if you go, I'm wearing green here. If you go under a certain light, you can't see it. You can't tell if this is green or blue. If you're in merchandise business, is that a big deal? If you want to go sell things, don't you think the color, uh, they call it color rendering index um, is a major thing? So the more color the light can emit, the better the light will be in terms of color rendering index. Okay, so be aware every every fixture will have a curve like this that will tell how good the fixture when it comes to color rendering index. We'll talk about this one. What color rendering index? The ability, the ability of this light to allow you to distinguish between colors, especially the green, the green and the blue, because you you might not be able to. Okay, any comments, guys? Any questions about the color? These curves that each one of them will have certain amount of colors with certain amounts it reflects certain amount of colors comments questions about that we will come to the color rendering index later on and later on guys you'll i'll show you how the higher the color uh, rendering index of um, um uh, the better the fixture will be okay now moving on so we know what the light that we need to do it has uh, it's basically different colors spectrum the visible spectrum it has a length and it has a frequency you can mix them together to give different colors the more you can emit of these colors the better the fixture would be because you can distinguish between different colors now let's get into what you guys were calculating yesterday the foot candle remember the calculation that you guys did yesterday with your friend chad the last thing um or the uh the second thing i'm going to hit on in this chapter is called light intensity light and intensity Okay, light intensity. The light in intensity, guys, there is a formula. The foot candle that you guys were doing yesterday, remember that foot candle? Foot candle equals the candela power. Now, what is the candela power? The unit of currency that we use in the U.S. is what? Dollars. That's a unit that they measure the light. It's called candela power. Um, it's candela power, and the unit for it, it's called lumens. So this fixture right above your head, it has two lamps in it. Each one of them is 3,000 lumens, like $3,000 each. You know, the unit that they measure the light is in lumens. That's how much light emit, is emitted from a fixture. So everybody understand what a candela power is measured in lumens, in lumens. You divide it by the distance. So for example, Adam, right above your head is a light fixture. If it has 6,000 lumens, Take the distance from the fixture to your head is six feet. Take the 6,000 lumens, divide it by six feet times two, square it, the distance squared. That will teach you how many foot candles average that fixture is emitting right above your head. Does that make sense, guys? How they calculate the foot candle? This is called the point method. The point method. One more time. Um, you take the candela power, divide it by the distance. So, for example, here's the lighting fixture. Here's the distance. Here's where uh, Adam's head is right here. Here's where the lighting fixture. Here's the distance. Here's how many lumens we are emitting all the way to his head. If you take the number of lumens, happen to be 3,000, three is the number of lamps. We have two here, but let's say there was three lamps. Three lamps, each one is emitting 3,000 lumens. Divided by the distance is four feet. Square it, because the formula says square it. You get yourself, um, when you do the math, you get yourself 563 foot candle, 500, an average of 563 foot candle. I hope I did the math right there. Um, so that's how you find the foot by hand, the foot candle calculation. Chapter four and five, guys, we're going to go detailed calculation. So we're going to be doing it in detail. Any comments, any questions? So how do they define a foot candle? Here's how they define a foot candle. Here's a lighting fixture above Adam's head. If you take one lumen coming out of that fixture to one foot away from the fixture, divide it by a one square foot, that's giving you a foot candle. One more time. The definition of a foot candle, guys, is a one lumen hitting at one square foot 
that are one foot away from the source. One more time. So a uh, foot candle is one lumen hitting a one square foot that's a one foot away from the source. That's defined as a one foot candle. Any comments, any questions? Karen, you will appreciate visual a lot when we start doing the, uh, the calculation by hand, guys. You will appreciate all this calculation. So the software that we used yesterday, when you guys were clicking on calculate, they're using a formula very similar to this, very similar to this. Before I let this go, I would like you guys to look at it in page, uh, please, page six. It defines the foot candle. It says foot candle equal candela power over the distance square. Can you guys see that? And um, and Derek, the first rectangle, this is how they define it. Can you guys see that? Here's one lumen hitting a square foot that's uh, one foot away from the source. One more time. A uh, one lumen hitting a uh, one square foot that's uh, one foot away from the source. That's the definition of a foot candle. Do you guys remember what, like, uh, how this, how they defined a volt? A volt, you know, a volt, when you define one volt as a one amp pushing from facing a resistance of one ohm, that will get you one volt. Any comments, any questions? So take your lumens, divide them by the square of the distance. That will get you the um, the, the uh, that will get you the foot candle. So I can't emphasize, guys, the the foot candle is when it comes to the foot candle. There are three factors, uh, Karen. There's the lumens coming out of the source, the area that you need to illuminate, and the distance between the light and the area. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? We fully understand that one. The lighting, how many lumens come out of the fixture, how far is the fixture from the area, and what's the square foot of that area will decide how many foot candles you're going to have in this area. So that's called light intensity. Light intensity, the foot candle. Any comments, guys, about light intensity? We will be doing calculation in Chapter 4 and so forth. Contrast. Contrast, in order to make things look, um, this Karen, you probably can talk about this better than anybody else. In order to make things stand out, you have to have more color, more light on the object than the surrounding. So Derek, if, I, if you are going to be a, uh, a singer, you see that spotlight, they, they, they shine right on the singer, so it shows and dark right around them. That's the extreme when it comes to the theater, right? So long story short, in order for things to be seen, if I want to make you stand out, I have to put more lights on you than your surround. Okay? If if the if there's if there's a light on you as well as your surrounding, you do not stand out. Does that make sense? So that's called it the contrast. The contrast. <laughs> So, and it, it's used a lot in um, uh, in accent uh, lighting, guys. You have the Mona Lisa on the wall, and you want it to stand out. So what do you do? You shine the light right, spotlight. You put right the spotlight at it. So if you guys become a, light, a certified lighting designer, Adam, it becomes a big deal. Can I can I have thumbs up, Chad? We fully understand what contrast means. General lighting, though, we don't need a lot of contrast. I don't need to for here where we're sitting here co contrast guys not a big deal it becomes for accent light as well as spotlight where you want to things stand out merchandise is a big example okay everybody knows the contrast um the last thing is guys a foot candle recommendation foot candle recommendation gentlemen ladies and gentlemen coming from a, an entity called iesna ies international Illumination Society of North America. International, because it, it is international. Illumination Society, our branch here is called North America. Those guys put recommendation, foot candle recommendation for certain areas. The software, um, Adam, that I gave you yesterday, guys, uh, and I, we walked you through this software, has certain recommendation for these light, right? I'll show you later on when we start putting around with that software, there's recommendation. When we gave you guys the foot candle for the areas for that commercial building, it's based on the IES 
uh, recommendation. So do me a favor. Can you guys go to page uh, six? Page six has a foot candle recommendation for certain areas. For example, example of suggested mean horizontal foot candle values. Mean is the average. Remember the average that we did yesterday? Um, and again, I parking lot in industrial plant, they recommend a mean of 0.5 foot candle. Our project guys ask for 0.5 minimum. Okay, so these are recommendations. If you look at the last one, extracting inspection area, you need 750 foot candle. So paint shop area, 500. You can imagine, Adam, the more precise job you need to do, the more foot candle you need. That makes sense. Right above your head, guys, in a, in a school, recommendation is 76 foot candle. 76 foot, 70, 76 foot candle. These are the recommendations. I want you guys to be aware that there are recommendations from IES. Um, and in the software that you guys do, they also, if you, I'll show you later on, if you go to the software, we'll tell you where to find these recommendations. Right underneath is also in a, in a chemical plant and what's not, a general plant area within an outdoor industrial plant, they recommend one. So control room, 30 foot candle, one more time. There are, based on people's experience, guys, the experience of, of, of lighting calculation for different areas and what works and what's not, IES collected all this data and came up with recommendation for certain areas. The full set, um, Derek, is in the visual software. I'll show you. if Now, for the time being, guys, you were given these uh, through... Um, Halberg, we gave you these values, the 20 foot and the 25, right? The mean, the average. If you want to get the full spiel, IES publish them as well as all the softwares that we use, guys, Visual will have. That's all I have for you guys. Any comments, any questions about chapter one? Any comments, any questions? Does it make sense? No, yes. So that's what I... um. What I, what I want to show you. Um, so that's chapter one. I'm going to go over chapter two. Any questions guys about chapter one before we go over chapter two? They're very simple. Each one of them is three pages. Like you've seen, Adam, you can read them in a heartbeat. But please read them. Um, I used to teach this eight years ago. I used to do the IES um, fundamental package, guys. It, it was a lot of information. They go... Um, Derek, they go into the analysis, the uh, the analysis of, of the of the eye itself, how it's made and what's not. If you are to become a lighting certified lighting designer, you have to know a lot of stuff about how the eye sees, and the rods and the cones and what's not. I don't know how many of you guys how there's certain things in the light that sees the, I don't know, straight and the peripheral light and what's not. So they get into the science of the eye that. The uh, an anatomy, anatomy of the eye. Okay, we're not going to go that far. Any comments, any questions, guys, about this chapter? Comments, questions? Please read that one. Um, I will remind you because there are 15 questions at the end of this chapter. Do all the 15. The test on these chapters, guys, will be will be from these questions. Did you guys hear me? It will be from these questions. That's how I test on these chapters. Any comments, guys, before I move into next chapter? Comments, questions? Adam, does it make sense? Simple, easy to read? No? Derek? Okay, so that's what... Um, we go that one. I want to take you guys to um, next chapter. So now, now that... And I know this is busy... Now, what we did in the first chapter, guys, we talked about the nature of the light, and we said that light is made out of a color, a frequency, and a wavelength. We can mix them together to, diff to get different colors. There is this visible spectrum, start from the violet and end up with the red, um, and we know how to do the calculation and what's not. We have the contrast. Um, we have a foot candle calculation. We know what a foot candle lumens over a square of a distance from it. And we have foot candle recommendation from the IES uh, of North America. Now, moving into chapter two. Chapter two, guys, talk about lighting fix, lighting sources. So we have lighting sources or lamps and reason to select each type, lighting sources and lamps. 
I summarized the chapter for you guys in a few pages here, um, in one actual slide. There are, um, here's the sources of light, the artificial sources of light that we can do. And let me start with the first one. It's called incandescent lamp. Do you guys remember that one? You can boil an egg on one of these. Incandescent lamps. Have you ever tried put one and boil an egg? Literally. So there are sources. So in order to make light, guys, you have to burn energy, right? You have to burn energy somehow. Burning energy, the smarter than chat. See, what if we have a heater and we put voltage across it and it glows and makes light, right? That's called the incandescent lamps. Then fluorescent lamps, mercury, vapor, metal halide, high pressure sodium, low pressure sodium, LEDs, and induction. These are the six types, the most common six types of lighting for artificial lighting. Artificial lighting. Did you guys hear me? Six, uh, or what is it? Um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight types of artificial lighting. Can you have thumbs up, Chad? These are the artificial lighting. You've seen them before. Let's start with the first one. Incandescent lamps. Incandescent lamps, that's the one that I think we're we are phasing it out in the U.S. for commercial industrial application, right? You, you no longer, for energy code, guys, you cannot, shall not, install an incandescent lamp and get away with it for in, for um, for uh, commercial building. Um, Adam, there's 80% losses. 80% of what this incandescent lamp does is losses. That's why um, what per square foot is uh, what per square foot is very uh, high for these. It's a heater, inefficient. So a couple of things about this one: it's it takes a little heater uh, resistor. You put the voltage right across that baby, guys, and it glows. Uh, thank you, Edison, for inventing that one long time ago, and it, it served us for for a uh, hundred years or so. Um, so that's heater. You burn it, it glows, it gets you some light. Worked for many, many, many years. Great. What's the problem with it now for commercial industrial? It's inefficient, and it has a losses of eighty percent, eighty percent losses. So drop. That's why I put X here. Did you guys see an X here? Drop this fixture when it comes to a commercial industrial lighting calculation. Cool? And even residential now. Now, the smarter than Chad, Aaron, they put tungsten halogen. They have another, they tr so they try to make it more efficient, um, Derek. What they did is they have tungsten. And the way they, they use different materials, guys, that glows better, like tungsten. And they have halogen gas inside the uh, the bulb. You know what the bulb is, right? You put a halogen in it, so it makes it more efficient, right? So that's another type. Is uh, tungsten halogen is another type of the incandescent lamps. Again, it's more efficient than the regular uh, incandescent lamps, but it's still not uh, not not a best application for general lighting and commercial industrial. Any comment before I move from the incandescent lamps to the fluorescent? Can I have a thumbs up, Chad? We know that phase it out. Everybody's cool there. Okay. Um, before I leave it, guys, in page, uh, please, page 11, incandescent, incandescent filament types. Can you just see how many types they have the, these resistors? Everybody can see how many types of these resistors that they can burn to get you light. And they make it more efficient. Some of them, guys, have two... Um, Two levels, so you turn it on and off. It gives you different levels. So, um, and they give the number C9, C6, C C6, and what's not. Okay, so these are the uh, filament itself. If you guys go to page 12, please. Page 12 give you the incandescent lamp base types. So that lamp is have a filament or or, or a resistor that you can burn, but it has to be mounted to a base. Cool. If you guys look in page uh, uh, 12. The you have the E12, E17, E26. The bigger the number in the E is, the fatter the base is. Can you guys see that? The the, diff, the fatter the base is. Um, they have different type of bases. Um, so just be aware of that one. Um, so we have the mug BF, B40s, and 49D, and what's not. So these are all different types of bases that you can use for this incandescent lamps. Incandescent lamps. The last one I would like you guys to go is page 13, please. Page 13, incandescent lamp shape. So there are three things, um, Derek. There's the filament type, and 
many types. There's the, the bases, many types, and there's the bulb itself, also many types. So look at the first one. Uh, they have ER. Can you guys see how the ER looks different than the B and the C? These are all industry standards. So if you're type C, uh, it will look like this little thing here versus type ER looks like this, right? Look at the G, big ball. So different types. Guys, the most important thing in any industry is standardization. So, so in order to standardize, they start making certain shapes and giving them certain levels, right? So... Um, Here's the R, this is P-A-R, the PAR, parabolic. can you see that? You see them all the time, parabolic. Um, there's P and all these, uh, Amar and what's not. So what I want you guys to understand is, there are different types of bulbs, different types of filaments, different types of bases. And you know who is going to be specialized in this one? One day, one of you, like uh, uh, Andrew came here yesterday. Those are the guys who manufacture their distributors, the manufacturers of this product are the ones who are going to specialize with these types of, of uh, how to make them and where, where to use them and what's not. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Comments, any questions about the different types and reflectors and, and what's not? So that's my um, different type of... of uh, if you guys go to page... Um, if you go to page 14, tungsten, halogen, quartz lamp shapes, they have also the tungsten, halogen, you've seen them all the time, floodlight almost. Uh, they use different, look at the little ones, they use them when you're working, guys, outside in your garage, floodlight, what's not. Different type, T3, T4, and, uh, and what's not, okay? Different type of shapes that they use. Incandescent lamps, guys, are probably for commercial industrial application, it's, it's almost dead. Um, you can't meet the energy code. Because of the whole energy code, you can't meet it unless you really have a specific use for that. Okay. Before I leave the incandescent lamps, can can you guys assure me that we're not going to pick any incandescent lamps for this type of uh, light? They use them sometimes for spotlights. Like we're asking you guys to use them for spotlights on the wall to throw light on certain things. Okay. The second type of uh, lamp that we use is fluorescent lamps. Fluorescent lamps, guys, they work, and they call them the arc lamps. So fluorescent lamps, mercury, metal halide, high pressure sodium, and low pressure sodium, all these guys are called the arc. You know how they do it? They create an arc. They increase the voltage. There's anode and cathode. They increase the voltage, guys, across the anode and cathode so high that will start an arc, literally an arc. Right? They call them an arc lamp. By it's, there is no heater, you know. So they created an arc. When you create an arc, there's a ballast that maintain, pump the voltage high to create an arc and minimize the current to maintain the arc. So we now I have an arc. That arc, guys, when it arcs, it arcs in the ultraviolet. You can't see it. So the smarter than chair, take that bulb right above your head, guys, and have some phosphorus. They paint the inside with phosphorus material. This material will will convert the ultraviolet that I can see into a spectrum, a visual spectrum. Welcome to the fluorescent lights and mercury lights and metal hair light and high pressure. That's how they work. Any comments, any questions? One more time. Unlike incandescent lights where you guys heat a heater, a resistor, and glows, and you got your light, okay, basically you can coil an egg on it. The, all the other types, starting with fluorescent and um, the, the, the high intensity, they call them high intensity discharge from the mercury to metal halide, high pressure and low pressure, all these are high intensity discharge. Uh, they are working on the concept of an arc. They create an arc, there's a, a ballast, but voltage across it, pump the voltage high, there's different technology. It creates an arc, now we're arcing, and then it, it holds the currents um, low, so it can maintain the arc, and it converts the arc, the light that coming out of their arc, guys, it converts it into visible light through the paint that they do inside the bulb, phosphorus, some type of phosphorus. Okay, I have an arc lamp here. Um, there are two types of arc, guys. There is low intensity arc. This is the fluorescent one right above your head. And there is high intensity arc. These are the metal halide and high pressure sodium and uh, high pressure and low pressure sodium. Okay. 
any comments any questions guys about an arc lamps so you're going to hear the word that they say arc lamps arc lamps when they say an arc lamps they mean the fluorescent light is an arc lamp metal halide and high pressure and low pressure sodium and mercury these are all um uh, high these are all arc lamps any comments any questions everybody understand how um the arc lamps work. They create an arc and maintain the arc and convert the light coming out of the arc into visible light. Okay, fluorescent. Fluorescent, guys, there's T5 and T8. Yesterday, Adam, you guys were picking T8 when you were picking up. T5 and T8. The, the number here next to the T, uh, the number, guys, here is next. T is tub tubular. T is tubular, like round, like this. Okay, and the 8 is the diameter of the the diameter of that tube so when we say t5 or t8 you take the five divided by eight always by eight give you how the diameter of this fixture one more time karen if i ask you what is the rate what is the diameter of a t5 fixed in lamp what's the diameter of t5 lamp you take the five divided by eight what's the diameter of t8 lamp you take the 8 and divide it by what? 8. Why 8? That's what the industry for these standards guys. You divide it by what? 8. So T5, when they say T5, if you look at the T5 lamp, it's so smaller in diameter versus T8. So that's the diameter. Where would we use fluorescent lights, guys, for the most part indoor? For the project that you're using with your friend Chad, where all everything inside almost is specified as in uh, as fluorescent. Indoor. Very efficient. So that's your that's your um, um your fluorescent with arc lamps guys you need a ballast the ballast create an ultraviolet light it treat it into a visible light that's what we we're just talking about how the ballast uh, pump the voltage create an arc the arc is an ultraviolet light you treat it into a visible light and off it goes off it goes any comments guys about the arc lamps any comments about the arc lamps yes no Makes sense, no? Okay, so that's then we have mercury vapor, we have metal halide and high pressure sodium. And a long time ago, they start with the mercury vapor, and then we start having uh, frogs with three legs instead of four legs, and then and and tree huggers like your friend Chad and his wife start being upset. So we phased out the mercury. So what they do, guys, is they have an arc, they have a, a lamp. And they create an arc, then they, then they put some type of a, a, a vapor gas or what's not inside it to get to, to treat that lamp. So they used to use mercury in it, um, and mercury obviously is not good for you, so they, we phase it off. Then your second option, guys, is metal halide, high pressure sodium, low pressure sodium. When we're outdoor, Derek, you're, when, yesterday, guys, you remember when we were picking up an M fixture? metal halide so what they do is an arc they have a um it's a high intensity they call it high intensity discharge they create an arc and they treat it with metal halide inside the arc that's the most common one right now or they put high pressure so they put sodium inside it yeah? or low pressure sodium high pressure sodium or low pressure sodium uh then the latest technology obviously is leds now invading everything else from indoor indoor outdoor and there's also something called induction light where they create an induction current that creates a light. So to summarize, to summarize what we have done, guys, if you for a commercial building, if you're doing now everything is going LEDs, everything is LEDs. Next project, guys, all the lights are going to use the LEDs. Excluding the LEDs, if you're doing a commercial building, your option number is going to be fluorescent indoor. And if you're outdoor, you have two options, either metal halide, the most common, or high pressure sodium. These are very efficient outdoor outdoor areas, as well as um, warehouses and what's not. Very efficient way, big floodlights, metal halide, big light, give you big floodlight and so forth. So that's basically all the types of the light sources, guys, from the incandescent lamps, the, the least efficient into the Look, the LEDs is the most efficient now in terms of watts per square foot, in terms of watts, uh, watts per uh, lumens per watt. How many lumens they can get you per watt? Any comments, any questions? So we have incandescent lamps, we have arc lamps, 
The arc lamps are divided into two arcs, low intensity arc, which is the fluorescent, high intensity arc, which is vapor, metal halide, high pressure, and low pressure sodium. Uh, mercury, because we create uh, um, frogs with three licks, we don't use them anymore. So that will leave us with metal halide, high pressure sodium, are, are your two options for high intensity discharge outdoor for parking lot and what's not. Low pressure sodium is the most efficient one. Anybody knows what the problem with low pressure sodium? You cannot distinguish between colors. It has zero color rendering index. You can see black and white, basically. If you're at night, good luck finding your, if your car, car is a color car, green or blue, good luck if you have, uh, if you have uh, low pressure sodium. Okay, so these are the type of fixture. Again, LEDs are used now, guys, inside or outside all the time. Um, so do me a favor, go to page 16, will ya? Please go to page 16. There's a, a, at the top of page 16, there's something called lamp lumen maintenance curve for typical fluorescent, thousands of hours of operation. Can you guys see um, the best for, phosphorus low current and the common phosphorus low, high current? I want you guys to look at this. Um, so look what happened to the lumen uh, maintenance. The lumen goes down. Can you guys see that the lumen goes down as, as the bulb ages? Did you see that? Look at the curve. If it's a normal, if it's a standard one, after ten after ten thousand hours, you're down to half the amount of lumens that comes out of that bulb after ten thousand hours. If you treat that baby, look at this. If you have the best phosphorus low low current, it, you can maintain a hundred percent of the amount of lumens coming out of this this fixture for ten thousand years. So I mean ten thousand hours years, man, that would be a long. Okay, do me a favor, go to page, please go to page 18. In page 18, give you detail of typical mercury vapor lamp and also metal halide. Can you guys see that? You have, here's where you start your arc in here, operating electrodes. You have your electrodes into it. Uh, it's inside a bulb. What they do inside this bulb, Derek, is they put either mercury or metal halide or they can put uh, um, uh, high pressure sodium. That's how they, the, the chemicals that they put inside. That's what makes the fixture different. Do you guys understand how they start the, the arc and they treat them? High pressure. I want you guys to look at page detail of mercury vapor, how you start the arc. Can you guys see where um, you have an arc here? You have the electrode and uh, two electrodes and you start an arc between them. Um, I want you guys to go to page 19, will ya? In page, any question about these? Any questions about the, the structure of these fixtures? If you go to page 19, please, the upper one, uh, Fig 2.8, warm-up characteristics of, uh, of mercury vapor. The problem with high-intensity discharge, guys, it will take them 5 to 10 minutes to warm up. Have you ever seen that? You turn them on, and they sit, and they sit, and they sit, and they sit for 5 minutes until they come up to full speed. If you turn them off, Adam, and turn them on again, there's wrist strike. It will take another 15 minutes for them to cool down and turn up again. Do you guys hear me? That's the problem with high intensity discharge, metal halide, high pressure sodium, uh, low pressure sodium, or mercury if, you, if you're using mercury. Um, so wrist strike, they call them the start. So if you guys look at the uh, warm up characteristics, um, so we have a warm-up characteristics, lamp, uh, lamp amps goes up as you turn them on, percentage of normal um, uh, number of minutes, warm-up, can you guys see the number of minutes that you have, you have to warm up? So most of them takes at least three minutes to come up to a full speed when it warms up. Um, can you guys see that? Within three minutes, all of them come up to speed. So if you have, high, if you have light, parking lot light, and in the middle of the night, you went high this discharge, you turn it off and turn it on again. It will take five minutes to cool down, five to ten minutes to cool down. Then another couple of minutes, guys, to warm up to a full speed. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? We fully understand the high pressure sodium and what's not. They need warm up time. And if you were to turn them on and off, off and on again, they need time to cool down and start the cycle over again. Matt, does it make sense? Adam, does it make sense? Warm up. Okay, so that's basically what we do. So please, now, fluorescent uh, current does not need this. LEDs does not need this. So there's an advantage for LEDs and fluorescent being used 
um, in parking lots and what's not, guys. Um, they don't need warm up time. They turn on and off immediately, they come up to full speed. If you guys look at the bottom 2.9, lumen and life characteristics, that's so important. When it comes to lamps, guys, lamps are expensive. How often do you want to change them? So look at the first one. Um, approximate lamp, uh, these are for mercury, but don't worry about that. This, all of them have the same thing. For example, thousands of hours. If you have high intensity discharge, you're looking at 24,000 hours of operation before you change them. So some of them have 12. If you're looking at incandescent lamps, you're looking at uh, 10,000 hours of operation. So it becomes a big deal, guys, how um, how long would this lamp live becomes a major characteristics. Uh, thousand, if you have lumen uh, curve, if you look at the lumen maintenance curve um, on the right side, thousands of operation for 24,000, for 24,000, after 24,000 hours, um, these lamps will maintain only up to 40% of their lumens. Can I guess get you to understand that there are a couple of concepts. For the lamps, how long will this lamp live is a big deal. 24,000 hours or 10,000 hours or or 1,000 hours. Number two, how much of the lumens will be maintained over the life of the lamp? That's a major part, right? That's how, how much, is it, is it going to maintain 50% of it after 24,000 hours? So long story short, gentlemen, these are all the characteristics that you take into consideration. That's why the recommendation, like I said, if you're going outside, if you don't want to LEDs now, is a big deal because they live for a long time. Um, they're bright, what's not. Uh, they're energy efficient. But before high intensity discharge, you're outside, you're high pressure sodium or metal halide because these are the most efficient, the ones that maintain their lumens for 24,000 hours. Um, and, and and they live 24,000 hours, they maintain most of their lumens for 24,000 hours. Does that make sense? If you guys go to page 20, please, it, it's give you lumen and life characteristic of high, uh, high intensity discharge, HID, high intensity discharge lamps. If you look at the first one, um, um, lumen maintenance curve or vapor, so you can see how there are different, uh, there are different characteristics. I want to bring to your attention the last one, uh, high pressure sodium, guys. Can you see for 24,000 hours, Derek, for 20,000, after 24,000 hours, the fixture will go only down to 80% of its lumens. So if it's supposed to give you 100, if that lamp is supposed to give you 100 lumen, after 24,000 hours of operation, it will give you 80. That's good. I mean, it didn't lose a whole lot. It lost only 20. Anyway, so these curves, guys, are a major part on deciding how to choose a lighting fixture for certain application. When you put a fixture, guys, you need, we'll talk about when you put fixture, you need to take into consideration a lot of things, a lot of things. Um, if you guys look at page 21, there is a warm up for um, uh, uh, high pressure sodium. Look at the high pressure sodium, Adam. It needs it needs five minutes to come up to speed. Can you guys see that in page 21, 2.11? It gives you look at this. It starts with zero, go all the way up, 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 up. After five minutes, five to six minutes, it come up to a full brightness. That's a disadvantage. The warm up time longer. Look at the current. There's an inrush current. Can you guys see the current at the top? There's high current up to 100, almost 130%. It will suck more current when you start it. That's like starting current, inrush current. Okay, any comments, guys, how to read these curves? Keep in mind, high intensity discharge guys need warm up time from three minutes to five, six minutes. And also, when you flip them, they suck more current. They call it the inrush. Inrush. The last thing I would like you guys to look at is in page 22, please. Page 22. Probably for you beginners of this science, guys, page 22 is the best. It, it, Adam, it compares the efficiency of all these fixtures that we talked about. Let's start with, can you guys see that on the horizontal side, it says efficiency in lumens per watt. Always lumens per watt. How many, the more lumens per watt, the more efficient the fixture is. Okay, let's go with the incandescent lamps. 20 lumens per watt. If you guys look at the mercury vapor, 55. Go to the fluorescent, 100 lumens per watt. If you go to the metal halide, 125. High pressure sodium, uh, 40, 140. Low pressure sodium, 200. 
um, perfect energy conversion, the perfect one, of course, you're not going to have a perfect one, 683, um, but we can. So can you guys see the most efficient fixture based on this graph is low pressure sodium. Now, why can't we use low pressure sodium all the time, Derek? Because it has very low color rendering index, meaning you can't see things out of, uh, you can't see colors. You can see things, but you can't see colors. Summarize, unless you use LEDs, guys, your option number one is going to be fluorescent indoor, metal halide, or high pressure sodium outdoor. Based on a couple of factors. Number one, efficiency. Number two, uh, long longevity for the fixtures. Color rendering index, number three. So these are the things that are going to keep in the consideration when you pick your uh, lamp. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Any comments? Any questions? Does that make sense? All the types of lights? Does that make sense? Any comments? Any questions? Comments? Questions? I'm going to stop right here, guys. I don't want to go to chapter 3. I'll do chapter 3 another time. Um, so we'll uh, talk about different type of films. Okay. To summarize, guys, what we did, we talked about the science of light, the uh, science of lighting, basically, or the nature of light. We said the light have a color and a frequency and, and a wavelength. We can mix colors to get you different color. Lamps, you can manufacture lamps to give you a certain colors. Um, there are different type of lamps, the sources of, of, of artificial light uh, or manufactured light from the incandescent all the way to the LEDs. LEDs are the most efficient right now. They're a little bit more expensive. They're coming back in price. This project that you guys are working with, Chad, is gonna be high intensity discharge, outdoor and fluorescent indoor. Next project will be completely LEDs. Did you guys hear me? Because uh, I would still want you to know how to use fluorescent because they're still there. So otherwise, we probably would use LEDs for everything, but not this project. Next project. When they say T5, guys, what's the diameter of a T5 fixture? You take the 5 divided by 8. So 5 8 is the diameter of that fixture. T8 is 8 divided by 8. I'll get you an inch diameter. So if you want to tell Derek, look at it, if it's smaller in diameter, that's a T5. What's uh, what's the difference? The difference, guys, the bigger the, the, the diameter, uh, the smaller the diameter, the better the source. I, uh, before I let you guys, I have something here for um, from the Thonia website. Um, okay, here's a fixture, a catalog from uh, a Hall of Fame, guys. This is a 2 by 4 fluorescent lighting fixture. Um, this is what you guys are going to be doing for your friend Chad. Look at the intent use, high performance, deep, cell, parabolic, luminaire, <coughs> for superior light control, visual comfort, and what's not. This is an office type fixture, probably. Uh, construction, uh, finish, what's not, system, lighting. Here's what I would like to take you guys to the catalog number. So... Um, Derek, my friend, it's called, it's a fixture or THP, the type of fixture, three inch deep, cell parabolic, two inch wide, uh, that's how the series. Uh, the trim type, either G for grid or overlapping uh, flange, so this is how you mount this. If you go air, air function, this is how you read the catalog number, guys. If you have A, A for air supply return, slots in uh, side trim. If you guys look at this fixture above your head, do you see a gap between the fixture and the grid? No. Sometimes you guys walk and you see fluorescent light and there's a gap around the fixture. That's because they allow the air, the return, the air return. So these are how you choose uh, air return and what's not. Number of lamps, you can use two all the way up to four. Lamp type, 32 watt. Um, uh, 32 T8, 48 inches. These are your option. Uh, number of cells in these um, louvers that we have. You can have 12 all the way 32 cells. Finish, LD low irradiance. So you have different type of finish that you can get. The voltages, can you guys see the voltage that you can do? You can do from 120 volt, 277, 347, or M volt. What's M volt? Anybody? Um, volt multi voltage so this if you specify a ballast with m volt um that will give you a multi voltage um 
multi multi voltage. So meaning you can you can hook it up in any voltage, shape or form. Options. Here's a couple of other options, guys. You can do. Uh, the most common options is the ballast, electronic ballast with less than 10% total harmonic distortion, instant start or rapid start. Any comments, guys, any questions about the type of fixture and how to read it? Yesterday, we were looking at this fixture. Here's an example of how to read the catalog number. Um, I will talk about this one, guys, when we talk about Chapter 3 here, the, the efficiency and the walls and what's not. Any comments, any questions? Any comments, any questions? My expectation, guys, is you read these chapters. We will be testing you on um, basically on some of these information. That's all. Cool? I'm not sure if Halberg will be here today or not, but that's all I have for you today. And I do have a headache. Otherwise, I wanted to do a chapter three, but I did I give you a headache too? <laughs> all right. So why don't we... Um, look at the power, guys. How is the power going? Your power is doing good? Everybody's good? If you guys are done, we're about to done with your power. Let me look at it before you print. Um, you have plenty of things to do for the lighting, right? Visual software? Plug it in. Thank you.